Hello, Harvey Audio Stuff. Welcome back. Have you ever wondered how Philip Bloom gets that really unique look to his footage? I'm going to be taking a look at his shooting style, lenses, grading, editing, and hopefully you'll feel as inspired as I do when I see his work. Don't worry, I'm not stepping on anyone's toes by making this video. I spoke with Philip and he's totally cool with it. Just to be crystal clear, the purpose of this video is not so you can just copy his style. It's more so you can draw inspiration from it. After all, the essence of the Philip Bloom look is his locations that he chooses, the subject matter, the framing, the composition, the music and the story that he tells using all of those things. First up, camera bodies. And this is an area that I really didn't want to talk a great deal about because, let's be fair, Philip uses a wide variety of camera bodies and he's always able to get that bloomy look. But for anyone who's interested, his current choice as of 2018 is the Sony FS7 Mark II, but he's also been known to use Canon C200s, Sony A7R2, and now probably three, and to be honest, many more. Next up we're talking lenses, and Philip uses mainly a variety of photography lenses from Canon and Sigma Art series, um, which he adapts to his Sony FS7 Mark II. I've also seen him use a lot of the Zeiss Bartis lenses, I think that's how it's pronounced, and he does that to make use of the continuous autofocus you can get in the Sony Alpha range, particularly the A7R2 and 3. However, there are a few lenses that I know he particularly loves, and they are the Canon 100-400 Super Zoom version 2, the Canon 70-200 f2.8 version 2, who wouldn't love that lens, and also the Sigma Art 35 and 50mm f1.4 prime lenses, which, I mean, they're they're amazing as well. So it seems to be a mixture of very long focal lengths and very wide aperture lenses. That seems to be the key to getting that Philip Bloom aesthetic. Rarely do I ever see Philip using ultra wide angles, so I'm just going to say it. Ultra wide angles don't look very bloomish. Philip loves slow motion. It's no secret. He's mentioned it many times, and I think that's one of the main reasons why he really loves using the FS7 II, because it can shoot really great looking slow motion. There's just something so satisfying and glorious about shooting a great moment in 100 frames a second or more and seeing it play back in slow motion. It means any kind of camera shake is reduced to almost nothing. You can hand hold a shot, a shot and it looks like it's been shot on a gimbal. Philip uses it frequently and with very pleasing looking results. Um, it's a great technique. It's something to always bear in mind when you're on a shoot. Um, and it's also, I feel like, an, a technique that can be overused. So just be mindful about how much you shoot. Another technique that Philip is known for is lens whacking, and it's a fantastic filmmaking technique to have in your arsenal, and if you've not tried it before, I know you're gonna love trying it. I found it works best on mirrorless cameras with stabilized sensors and adapted lenses, and usually standard focal lengths work best, 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, somewhere in that I found is the sweet spot. All you need to do is set your lens's focus to infinity, disconnect the lens from your adapter, and hold it just slightly apart from the mount. By moving the lens around and varying the amount of light that gets in, you'll be able to control the focal plane and the amount of flaring and light leaks in your scene. The result is a dreamy look that can add a lot of interest to a dull looking scene. What I like to do is combine lens whacking with slow motion and you get a really stylized and super cool look. I recommend you try it. I feel like it's worth mentioning that Philip has done a lot of experimenting with shooting in infrared over the past few years. It's honestly not something I've ever had experience with um, because it requires a permanent modification to your camera's sensor. Whilst it's a really interesting look, it's not quintessentially bloom. 
and certainly not a technique that's really relevant in commercial videography. In fact, Philip recently said something similar uh, along the same lines. So, infrared, worth a mention. In terms of the picture styles that Philip uses, I know he loves using log in cameras that have solid codecs and high bit rates. If he's not using log and he's in the Sony world, I know he likes using Cine 2 Gamma and the Cinema Color Space. Here's a clip that's filmed in log from the short film I've got coming up later. It's exposed pretty brightly so that we get clean shadows but not enough that we lose highlight detail. After grading, I was really happy with the look I got. I just love the flexibility you have when you work with log. If your camera doesn't have these options, say you're using a DSLR from Canon or Nikon, that's no problem. Uh, just use the most commonly used video settings so turn your saturation, sharpness and contrast down and you'll be set. Philip, for a while now, has been a fan of Film Convert, which is um, some pretty pro software for grading your footage. It has absolutely everything you'd need, including camera-specific picture styles, beautiful look-up tables, including some stunning film stocks, simply the best film grain effect I've ever seen, plus you can export 3D LUTs of your custom setups. So I totally understand why Philip uses it. It's linked below if you want to check it out, you can trial it for free, um, they're not a sponsor or anything, um, and it's actually quite decent value for money, so definitely check it out. In terms of lookup tables, well, Philip has some that he helped develop, um, and they're called DeLutz, D-E, Lutz, and they're very stylized, but I really like them. Here we can see an evening shot in S-Log3, and then when we apply the LUT, we can see it has lots in common with Philip Bloom's signature style. In this shot, I used a longer focal length and shallower depth of field for a more bloomy look. Here's an example using Sony Cine 1 and Philip and his partner James Miller made a variety of different profiles for different cameras. They can look quite extreme at 100%, so I would advise dialing them back till you're happy with the look you get. Again, I'll pop a link below for you to check out. Not a sponsor again. Um, they're, unfortunately, they're not free, but they are inexpensive. For most of Philip's short films, you'll notice he uses a really cinematic aspect ratio, usually something like 2.35 to 1, which really helps to sell that cinematic feel. The thing is, initially, this may seem like something that you can just decide later in editing, but actually I really think that it requires quite a bit of forethought uh, when you're shooting. You'll need to consider your composition, framing, and camera movement, all of these things might need adjusting to actually work with one of these extreme cinema aspect ratios. Here is the classic 50mm focal length that we all know and love. It looks pretty great, but it doesn't look very cinematic. When I apply the cinematic 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, the first thing you'll notice is I'll need to adjust the offset of the picture because it just looks strange. And whilst it looks pretty cool, I can't help but feel that it looks a little bit claustrophobic. So at this stage I switched over to another of my favourite prime lenses, Canon's 35 f2. Of course it looks noticeably wider, and actually a little bit wider than I was hoping for this kind of scene, but when we apply the 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio it looks great. I just know that this is one of those times that if I'd shot in 50mm I would have been kicking myself in editing for not considering the aspect ratio. When we look at them side by side you can see there's a huge difference and it's definitely something to nail in camera when you're out shooting. Fortunately, most external monitors come with guidelines or a safe zone, they sometimes call it. So if you know you're going to be delivering in one of these uh, very cinematic aspect ratios, definitely use those tools. Another key factor that has a profound effect on the emotional impact of Philip's footage is the music he chooses. I have no idea where Philip gets his music, Definitely let me know in the comments if you do know, but the quality is always exceptional, the composition always moving, but the craziest thing is that the way he edits his footage and the way he ties the music in, it's, it's like they were written together, like the music was composed for the film and the film was written with the music in mind.
It's a huge and vastly underestimated component of Philip's style. And on that note, I just wanted to mention slash announce, I guess, that I, in the not too distant future, am going to be releasing all of the music that I've written over the years uh, for a very, very modest price. Um, and it's a culmination of months of creative blood, sweat and tears. Uh, and I really hope you're going to love it. So just watch this space. Um, that's to come. And that's it for now. I really hope you enjoyed this and I hope this video came across the way I was intending. So yeah, until next time, let's help each other out and shoot better video. See you next time.